Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles, host of the Angelo Robles podcast and the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. I'm really going to be loving today's session. And don't say that I say that too much. I have great guests on. Social tokens, NFTs, metaverse, and a bonus is Bitcoin, a Ponzi scheme. So really, really excited about today. One of my favorite digital asset experts and investors, JJ Sowers. JJ, welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me back. Really appreciate it. Let's get right to it. Are, All right. are NFTs, non-fungible tokens, are NFTs a fad? I would say they're definitely not a fad. And this is actually a once in a century paradigm shift because now we're finally moving into totally real use cases for the blockchain and mainstream people are actually recognizing this. I mean, it's incredible, the future. I mean, right now the prices and everything may, may seem high, but who are one of us to judge? Because people will argue or debate, 2.9 million for a tweet from Jack Dorsey, is that person crazy? And I said, well, I might not necessarily wanna pay that for it, but here's the thing, that's a piece of internet history. It's just like people collect the first Apple computer and the first computer that maybe the government made or whoever, those are collector's items. So why wouldn't the first tweet by the founder of Twitter be a piece of internet history? And then you have things like art being auctioned off at Christie's on um, Beeple's pieces. And one of the pieces was, um, I think went for like 69 point something million dollars. So that really got everybody excited. And it always seems that you know high prices get everybody excited, but it's just like Bitcoin back in the day. Everybody always knew the technology of blockchain had some great use cases. We just weren't 100% sure is Bitcoin going to last over time. And it's lasted over you know 12 years now, so almost. So it's obviously held the test of time. No one's really been able to hack it. No one's been able to shut it down. And I think people are going to see too, because I'm hearing people say, well, I don't know about these you know, pictures of art, this, that, and the other, but they do get that the technology of non-fungible tokens and um, basically marking things in the blockchain certificate of authenticity is um, definitely a decent use of the technology. And I don't think people have even really got it yet that this is gonna be incredible for music, for musicians, creators of all sorts. Before we get to that, in your virtual background that looks like Patrick Mahomes, if you could explain what that is in your involvement in NFTs. Yeah, so that, that is Patrick Mahomes. And it's actually a, a picture of the NFT that, that was sold. So he himself got together with somebody, I don't know who the partner was, and created these NFTs. And he had a few different ones. And I bought this one on a site called Maker's Place. So it's pretty cool because it just shows a picture, you know, with his mouth open, but it's actually, it's like, shows a little video and he's going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and I have a theory on this too. So the reason I bought it was, is because it's directly from him. So it's actually pretty cool. It says Patrick Mahomes sent you, but regardless of that being a fanboy, it's not an official NFL licensed product, just like Gronk. So I have a feeling that the NFL is going to do like the NBA and get official licensed products. So something like this in Grox is going to be so rare that there's some probability the value could go through the roof. Even if the NFL says it's like contraband and it's not real and all this, that may actually help the price. Yes, that actually probably will. And since you mentioned that, one of my favorite followers on Twitter, I know you're a fan as well. He's a great writer, a great gambler. And really why he's great at fantasy and gambling is he knows how to mitigate risk. It really pounces upon opportunities. If any of you do not follow Jonathan Bales on Twitter, you are crazy. He is really, really good. I've had some conversations with him. I think he's going to come on in the early summer. So he's pretty much renowned for him and some, and he's been known to say the future is moving more to digital. I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, I believe he's made millions relative on NFTs relatively recently. Uh, and he was active in the NBA top shot with the NBA, uh, you know, very good player, but not quite a star yet, John Morant. And I believe Watt for 35000 a couple of months ago. And now it may be worth as much as a million or even more. Yeah, so the NBA top shots is great. So when I, when I was growing up, yeah, I used to collect baseball cards and things like that. And they're obviously physical. And I believe we're going from, you know, analog to digital. Right. And the one great thing people don't realize in sports cards, you have to get them graded. And that makes the value go up exponentially because you can have For the sure. same card in perfect condition. But if you don't have that grade, it says it's nine of 10 or 10 of 10 stamped by the official grader. You could only sell it for maybe a 10th of that. 
And the great thing about something like Top Shots is you don't have to worry anymore about the grading. So you had that moment. The reason they call it a moment is because it's literally someone dunking a basketball or doing a great assist or stealing or blocking a shot. And that's captured in time. And you don't have to worry about the authenticity because it's actually documented on the Flow blockchain. So that, that, that's a pretty cool thing. And um, they're number two. So there could be 10,001, there could be 20,001. You have number one of 20,000. You might get number eight of 20,000. And the funny thing is, sometimes it's not number one created that's worth the most. It's the player's number out of the series that's worth the most. And I also learned, too, from a couple of people I told about it, started collecting with their kids. And they really enjoy these moments, watching the people dunk the basketball or do the steals. So it's, re it's really incredible. And uh, when you sign up for NBA Top Shots, they have these things called drops where they sell packs. And the price is anywhere from $9.99 mm -hmm. to, I think, $229 is the most I paid for a pack. But it's totally worth it because the uh, moment you get inside the pack, the individual ones are worth way more than the entire pack itself. So it's incredible. And you can get some great players like John Moran. You can get LeBron James. You can get all kinds of great players. And you also can sell them on the marketplace that they have. And you can buy them on the marketplace. And you can see all the ones that are for sale. And you can also, and what number they are, like number eight of, number 23 of. And you can also see, too, what the highest one sold for and the date it was sold. And then if you want to click on the little right hand side, there's this little thing. You can actually see it documented on the blockchain that particular moment. Yes. So in terms of, you know, there's people probably viewing or watching in that are a little bit older. This is all new to them. Uh, just like Bitcoin was what, like two years ago, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, and, you know, no one wants to miss out. Uh, so it's a different discussion, how much in a portfolio to allocate. It depends on so many different factors, but to ignore it and not be educated and miss out on potential tremendous asymmetrical opportunity is foolish, I think. But one question that probably is going to come up from that kind of person that I'm describing, and it probably would have been me four or five months ago, is, okay, interesting, MBA top shots, uh, there's other digital art and NFTs, but how do I become more active and actually do the purchasing? Where do I go? How do I do it? So there's a number of different platforms. And what's also cool about this is you could actually create or mint your own NFTs. So somebody can go, go on Rarible and make their own NFT. You could take a picture of yourself just doing something crazy or a video or even do an MP3 of music you play in a guitar and you create your own MVP, mint it on Rarible and put it up for sale and see what happens. And you can also go to OpenSea and create your own store. So, I mean, there, there's many ways to do it. And it's definitely just for the learning experience worth it just to do it. And also, I think for parents, something fun to do with their kids. Okay, but give me more than NBA top shots. Like where else could they go? And for the big time players, are there auction houses now involved in this? Yeah, so Christie's is famous now for, they're already famous, obviously, but they become <laughs> famous to crypto people who probably never even heard. Exactly. <laughs> for for um, auctioning off the people artwork, just like that every day's went for like 69 points something. So people can go there. And there's also other auction houses out there, even ones that used to be, you know, regular auction type things that people are auctioning off top shots and th things of that nature. So when you get to the real high dollar stuff, it does go to auction houses. But I really think people should definitely learn about NFTs, re read about it, go to Rarible, make your own NFT, especially if you have a kid, do it with them, go to OpenSea, create your own store, even if it's just for fun, you know, do some browsing to see the different things that are out there. And also, too, like um, one of the bands did it NFT, and you went to this website called Yellowheart, Kings of Leon. It was of 50 bucks. I said, why not? You know, I paid 50 bucks in the gas on the blockchain to do it was another like 50 some bucks, 60 bucks. And then what you did was you were able to download the digital MP3 and you had the NFT they gave you. But the real value to me is, is however many were created, they're going to actually print up vinyl, old school. Mm -hmm. And eventually you're going to claim your vinyl and they're going to send it to your old school in the mail. So that's almost going like from analog to digital back to analog. Another thing I think is going to happen with these things, that a lot of them are going to be redemption tokens. Yeah, it's a very good point. And again, although taking a little different approach than what you just said, if you think that things are going to be analog and stay analog and not move to digital, I mean, come on. I just, I, it, it's going to be nostalgic, like what you're talking about, analog to digital, then an analog version. But to think that we're going to stay in an analog world for years to come, that's just, you're being, 
you know, just foolish. You got to open yourself up to what are new opportunities that you're not used to. You mentioned music and you mentioned it with Kings of Leon and how this could change the artist and industry. Not every band or rapper is going to have millions of followers and, you know, go on tour and make a truckload of dough. This could be a way for musicians and creatives with a hundred to a thousand fans to potentially be successful and make a living. Well, absolutely, because, um, you know, there's a saying that goes around, if you just have 100 true fans, and some people say 1,000. Kevin Kelly, really, I believe, originated that from Wired, yes. That you really have a dedicated following. Well, now with the spinoff of NFTs, you could spin up your own album, and you can even pre-sell it, and then people could say, it'd be like a certificate of authenticity. Hey, I discovered this artist, or I followed him, you know, when he was truly independent, nobody cared if you make it big. And this might get a little bit more into securities, but eventually you'll be able to do NFTs. I mean, you can do it technically, where the person who buys it will be able to share in the royalties of the songs. But I really think it's great because let's just say you have a, only 100 true followers and they really like all your work. You could sell an NFT for $100 to each one of those people. That's 10 grand right there. And then you can have special NFTs or special perks that you know, if you pay another $50 or if you buy some of my social tokens that you create and you hold so many, we can have chats on Discord. I can give you a shout out. I can even make a song and mention you, or I can send you an MP3 NFT where I say, hey, what's up, Angelo? My biggest fan, love it, or something crazy like that. I mean, and people will go nuts. Yeah, there's more opportunities than just artists and musicians with that perspective. How many others with some degree of creativity with a little bit of a following which we'll cover at a little bit of a different time. Let's move on to something in the metaverse, which in and of itself may need a little bit of context and explanation. But again, why don't we start in reverse? What's your take on Decentraland? Yeah, so Decentraland is really cool and, and it's not new. A lot of people are just hearing about it now with all this NFT stuff. And I think somebody was on TV the other day talking about the metaverse and Decentraland and Sandbox. But I really think we're starting to get now to the intersection of VR and AR and mixed reality becoming a retail product. Because inside these blockchain products, you would buy the MANA token, which is Decentraland's token, and you'd be able to purchase real estate and you know, other virtual goods. And um, you know, in real life, people buy real estate and they hope it goes up in value. And of course, things like beachfront property and all are very rare. So it's the scarcity. So the idea is inside these platforms, people will buy this real estate. I call it mind share. I always have, and no one ever seems to care. And um, they're bidding up these prices now to ridiculous levels. And the idea is eventually people are going to rent these out for advertising and things like that. But I actually see a bigger picture. There are some smaller cap tokens like Polka City that I think you know, have tremendous asymmetric bet. And um, inside those, it's actually like real life real estate where you're renting stuff out. So you buy gas stations, you buy energy storage places, you buy taxis, and then you actually rent it out in the virtual world. So there's going to be more and more of these popping up, and it's going to be like a mindshare land grab of virtual real estate where someone's going to come in, buy a lot of it up, hope it goes up in value, and it's going to take a large community, obviously, to make these things go up in value. And then eventually, mainstream advertisers like like a Procter & Gamble or somebody like that are going to be like, wow, I need to get in on this because the younger demographic is all into this. How do I reach them? They're going to reach them in these metaverses by even having cool little augmented reality things and they'll be advertised and they'll advertise their products. And within like say games with these virtual pieces, someone will have a toothbrush and one of them will say sponsored by Procter & Gamble or Colgate or whoever makes a toothbrush or just use your imagination. It, it could be anything anybody wants to advertise. And I think in your subconscious mind, just by doing this kind of stuff, kids can be like, oh, wow, a new brand come out that's rivaling Nikes or something and it's on this shoe. They're going to automatically recognize that brand. And then when it comes out in the real world, they're going to want to have it because in the virtual game, that was like the most prestigious shoe to own. For sure. And although I in my opinion, you kind of covered it and we have a lot of things to cover. But if you had to give the audience that this is a little bit new to them, metaverse, what does that mean to you? So to me, metaverse is kind of like the old school second life where you know you knew it wasn't like in re IRL, the young kids call it in real life, but it was inside of computer gaming or a virtual fantasy world. But this is kind of blurring the lines between what's real and what's not. Because nowadays technology has gotten so good you can communicate with people in VR, AR, and it's all, I was on a, actually on a talk show type thing before I came on here doing something with a think tank thing inside VR. You sat at the table and there were other people. When you moved your hand in real life, your hand moved. I mean, it was, it, it was nuts. And you didn't have to wear glasses or any of those things. It was just all on your smartphone. So to me, it's just really interacting 
inside these virtual worlds, the metaverse, and the products, for lack of a better term, inside these things are actually non-fungible tokens, the real estate and things of that nature, and the gaming pieces. Now, I really think this is going to evolve because the younger generation really likes this stuff. I mean, not even necessarily the um, Generation X, but the Generation what are they, Generation Z, the ones after Y, those, those people have grown up only on a smartphone, only in the metaverse. Absolutely. And that's what I'm trying to get significant investors and family offices to understand. It's sometimes a little bit of a challenge. One of the questions I've really been looking forward to asking you, are platforms like Rally the next unicorns in the blockchain ecosystem? So I, I believe that they are, because right now the, um, the Rally token is around 100, 120 million, I think, in a market cap. But I really believe that it's going to be one of the dominant platforms, and it could easily be 10 to 100x the valuation is now. And once there's more clarification on regulations and things of that nature, there's going to be more and more people making social tokens on there. I mean, because, you know, let's think about it. If you're a big Hollywood star or a big rock star or a big musician or, or a big sports player or movie star or whatever you want to call it, your agents and your business manager might be a little bit leery about you being the one, you know, who's making the social token on a platform unless you're sure all the regulations are there, you're not violating any securities laws. So I really think that once all that's figured out, and there's also, too, things like that are issued by digital autonomous organizations. And I think we're going to start to get a lot of clarity when you sign a contract with a digital autonomous organization, what that really means. Because right now, you know, it's all up to interpretation. Yeah, we're going to get to some of that shortly. So again, I'm working backwards because some of you are probably saying, what the hell is Angelo and JJ talking about with Rally? How does that fit into what's a social token? Oh, and by the way, for those that don't know, and it's completely understandable, what is a social, a social token? JJ? Yeah, so a social coin or a creator coin, it's, as it's sometimes called, it's just if you're a creator or influencer and you join that platform, you actually have an ERC-20 token created that represents you. And, you know, sometimes there's a limited amount, sometimes there's not. That token is issued. But the way it gets out to the ecosystem is normally, like, we go back to the 100 or 1,000 people who really follow you. You actually are airdropping, which is basically gifting a token to that following to get the community going. And you say, well, why the heck would they want to go through all of that? But because in order to um, communicate, if you want a Discord or a private Telegram, you actually have to hold so many tokens in your wallet, and um, the blockchain knows that you hold that token, so it gets you access into the club. It's almost like a membership. So you know the, the younger people, they they love this stuff. They they love that because wow, they're they're special. They're part of this group. And then as an influencer creator, now you have a direct relationship with your fans. For sure. And a little bit back to Rally, because I also think it has tremendous potential. And again, who knows, it could go to nothing and you could waste all your money. Possible. Uh, but one of the questions we get from a lot of my family offices is like, OK, how do I I can't get it on Coinbase. How do I buy it now? If they're a large enough investor that uses an over the counter desk at one of those platforms, I guess that's probably going to be the easiest way. Uh, but there may be certain. Uh, apps they could download depending on their state have access if you could talk a little bit about that right so if somebody just wants to go small or even just they may want to do this with their kids also for a learning experience and, and for fun they can um download metamask and then they can go to uniswap which is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer exchange slash automated market maker and they could purchase something like rally on there i mean there's several exchanges also that are centralized that are not in the united states but i you know, you just got to do your diligence and use caution and things of that nature. But if you really want to make a, a big purchase and you're a hedge fund or a private institution or family office or make a really large purchase as a high net worth individual, you can always call an over-the-counter desk that can get something like Rally. And, you know, if you have a prime broker or somebody that doesn't know about it, you ask them. I'm sure if you're doing Bitcoin type or Ethereum type things with them, they can, if they can't do it, they can find someone in the ecosystem that can get you the token. And this will all pro probably start to get a little easier and a little easier. Uh, MetaMask and using Uniswap, that's a, that's a little advanced. Uh, so I would, you know, we're going to talk a little later about an opportunity where you could get more familiar with some of the things we're talking about. I know it's coming at you quick like a fire hose, but just be a little patient. Uh, so you did mention, I was going to bring it up, you know, the Wyoming State Senate passed a bill uh, entitling decentralized autonomous organizations known as DAOs, pronounced DAO, by the way, uh, 
what is this is one question I'll ask. And how is this going to be important to the digital asset ecosystem? So I think it's huge because um, for years, the guy from Binance, CZ, has been going around saying, you know, eventually he wants to make it that all the employees and all the shareholders of Binance actually are token holders via the DAO structure. And there's a lot of companies now in the United States that have gotten VC investment that are building or doing great things in the blockchain and actually have a token. But the investors are invested, you know, in the equity of the Delaware C Corporation. And there may be like companies like BMW or some really well-known company that has a contract doing something with this blockchain company. But the contract is not with the digital autonomous organization because I don't think any corporate lawyer in their right mind would let their company sign that. But once we get some clearance and they say, okay, maybe a digital autonomous organization has the same legal rights and the same rules as a limited liability company or something like that, but it's just digital. And what's huge about that too is the reason these companies want to be digital autonomous organizations is, is because they don't want to have a centralized entity. So all the token holders truly vote on the governance, the rules, and there is no centralized leader. It's totally, totally decentralized. And I think places like Wyoming are really doing a great job kind of being the pioneers, for lack of a better term, because there's a lot of stuff that's not unclear. Even with social tokens, is this a security? Or with NFT, if I make it that you have rights to music royalties, is that a security? People aren't really sure. And then people are doing things called wrapping NFTs and tokenizing like the Beeple 20, where you take 20 pieces of art and you tokenize it with a token and you and you sell pieces that are kind of like shares. Is that a security? And there's companies now, and that's another thing too, when I mentioned people and their kids, that really a lot of people always say, how? what would you ask your younger self or what would you do? You should actually ask yourself, if I was only 14 or 19, what would I be doing now but with the wisdom and knowledge I have and try to learn and apply it to what's going on in today's society. Because people always say, oh, if I knew then what I knew now, well, you know it now, you can always go back and do it. So why don't you apply to what you would think about all this if you were 19 or you were 14, if you would think this was cool. I'm actually working with a company called Oscillate that um, is planning on taking creators and stuff and turning them into stocks. So, I mean, that's, that's going to be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, very. I'd love to learn more about that. Very intriguing. Since you brought up that subject, I'm going to bring it up in a little different perspective. And I know my audience has heard me say this before, but I think it's incredibly important. I have a son going from high school to college in the coming months. Many have kids or grandkids, and we're starting to get younger people that are viewing and watching what I do. And I've been very fortunate. And I mean, I get resumes, I get questions from college kids, I want to be involved in entrepreneurship and business and finance. And I get the resumes, I mentioned my nephew before, and you know, they seem smart, very proficient, but they all kind of look alike and they're a little dry. There are colleges where you could get a deeper education in blockchain, but some of the things that we're talking about now, unless I'm missing it, I mean, maybe a little bit of Stanford at MIT, uh, but you're you're not getting it there you need to get self-educated and you could that is very possible youtube is one platform and things that we're doing are going to be another we'll get to that a little later uh but what would you recommend to someone who wants to be in finance learn the more traditional format how they could adapt and learn this and how valuable they would be to big banks to mfos to rias and to really anyone in the world of finance because this world is changing quick Right. So definitely YouTube is an incredible tool. So learning things on YouTube and then fostering your own critical thinking to form your own thesis. But I also believe there is some value in learning history. So it, whether it's in school or on your own, learning a little bit about history, like for instance, all this GameStop stuff and the meme stocks, the original meme stock and short squeeze actually happened in 1920 to 22, I believe was called Piggly Wiggly. And I kind of find that hilarious because if Piggly Wiggly, that happened today, that would definitely be a meme stock, Pig, Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> and, and now this has happened almost a hundred years later with GameStop and AMC and they're having these meme stocks and a short squeeze. So all this stuff isn't new. It's kind of like history recycles itself over time. So it's kind of important too for young people to learn the history, but then use a critical thinking to apply it to the day and say, what are the directional arrows? Where is the puck going? And it's funny too, because I think banks are waking up that Bitcoin is not a threat to them. What might be a threat to them is if they don't understand DeFi. So by learning DeFi and even learning like Reddit and things like that, you're very valuable to a hedge fund, a private equity fund, or a bank. Because I had heard, and I don't know if it's true, that a bunch of hedge funds got nervous and started hiring people who could help them go through these subreddits to see what the heck was going on when this GameStop stuff was blowing up. Maybe that was just TV sensationalizing it. But still, if you worked at one of these firms already and you were an expert on this and you went to, to your superior and you said, hey, I see this coming. I know this sounds a little crazy. But in these forums, Reddit, Wall Street Bets, this, that, the other, 
this could happen. I'm not saying it will. We just need to be careful. And then imagine it happened. You look like a genius. And then if you understand yeah. what's going on as far as DeFi and all that, and you go to them after that, you build some credibility. You say you know, to, to your bosses, hey, I understand we're a bank and this is how we operate. But we need to understand this DeFi so it doesn't disrupt us. Because just like Mark Zuckerberg always went around saying, you know, um, we have to disrupt Facebook before someone disrupts us. So you always got to kind of be thinking ahead. And now technology moves so fast and everyone learns so fast and this, that, and the other happens that you really have to be prepared. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have said it any better. Uh, completely agree. And I've been saying now for four or five months and I've not gotten one email or phone call from a family office, eventually it's gonna happen. And I'm not sure that I can really help them too much at the moment. You are absolutely gonna see, I mean, right now they're getting familiar with it. Some of them are investing as an LP in some of the opportunities and that's great, but you may wanna take a little bit of a step back, understand it better yourself, so self-education and look to hire independent thinkers about these subjects to give you guidance and we are on the cusp of seeing the kind of people we're talking about that are going to be working inside an SFO under a CIO, eventually as they get more experience and diversity, maybe become the CIO. And you're going to see some family offices that are and families of great wealth and others that are going to do incredibly well. That doesn't mean there's not going to be challenges and maybe some will crap out. Yeah, that might happen. Uh, but this is where things are headed. And again, I'm trying to shake up a stodgy industry. It's, uh, it's not always easy. Uh, we're not gonna have enough time today and it's enough of a fire hose already to go too deeply into DeFi and blockchain and some of all the opportunities there. That being said, I will bring up something. Uh, the audience should be familiar with how things are gonna be built on the blockchain more and more, including your brand and your website. So there's things like Unstoppable Domain, which basically has what, the dot crypto uh, that's on the blockchain. You should register your name. You should register a company name before someone else does that you know, for you. Now, I'm not getting into how to build out those sites to be more commercial. That's more complex than a traditional graphic designer or developer. I do think that will be getting easier. But if you could talk a little bit about the potential, including the investing potential of being like people were in the mid 90s buying up web domains, I think there could be some potential here too. So yeah, I totally agree with that. And I was going to say one last thing about the, the school and everything. I think a lot of companies are going to have a position one day, like a chief critical thinker. I don't know if they call it that, but that's what they're going to mean. And they're really going to hire somebody who just tries to think about all these things, directional arrows and this outcome and that outcome and what might happen as a ripple if this happens and thinking 15 moves ahead. I really believe that's the future. But I definitely agree with what you're saying that as far as domains go with unstoppable domains that you know you should if your family name is important to you get like your last name dot crypto if you don't want someone else to have it because once you buy one of unstoppable domains it's between 40 to 80 bucks depending normally i say normally and then it's yours forever and then you do have to claim it on the blockchain so you have to go on metamask and you have to claim it and all this other stuff but um, you don't want somebody else getting the name of your business. So if you have a business, XYZ business, you don't want someone else getting that name and having it on the blockchain forever. And they could be basically you know, showing it in a light that you may or may not like. And um, it's interesting too, like I think people's first names dot crypto are gonna be valuable, but right now they're not necessarily offering those. Like some yeah, of them have this thing right. called premium domain. So what they did with certain real estate names, others are actually more than 40 to $80. So, you know, some of these are going to be really valuable, like Bitcoin got crypto probably, which wasn't available, things like that. They're probably going to go for, you know, a million dollars or something like that. But I do think there's probably some unthought of or undiscovered domains and probably the shorter, the better as far as the letters that somebody's going to get for like four year 80 or even a thousand or 2000 bucks. That's going to be like the original domains, like you mentioned, it's going to end up going for millions. Yeah, I mean, I hopefully not being too self-serving here, but I hope many of you where this is kind of new to you and listening to me and JJ, specifically, definitely more JJ, uh, there's tremendous opportunity here. Some of you are gonna end up doing very, very well. And again, I would maybe mitigate and manage risk and exposure and begin to understand what you're looking to be more knowledge about, knowledgeable about and be involved in. But this, you know, again, like you said with Wayne Gretzky, skate to where the puck is headed. You don't think the puck is headed in this direction? Come on. It's, a, you know, to me, it's relatively so obvious. Maybe that's just me. Okay. 
Many of you know, I've been very active in Bitcoin, especially the last couple of months. I've had amazing guests on where I've learned so much. Lynn Alden, Raul Paul, JJ Sowers, Robert Breedlove, so many others, and including, of course, Michael Saylor. That was a lot of fun a couple of weeks ago. I still get emails and I try to be open to both sides because maybe I'm wrong. I'm wrong a lot, so you never know. Uh, and we know some of the people that take the other argument, but I do still get the question, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme or a Ponzi or a pyramid scheme? And those are two different things. So I'm gonna take a second, I'm gonna rephrase the question and then JJ, I want you to go at it as we kind of take it to the home stretch. And again, that question is, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme? And then part two, is it a pyramid scheme, if there's such a word? Right, so it's definitely not. And I'm absolutely surprised that people are still asking that question. I always say they're actually asking the wrong questions because what they should really be asking is how big is the opportunity relative to the downside of not holding any Bitcoin? But real quick, I want to say one last thing about these domains. One thing that people are missing is really important is you can make a website with these domains, a blockchain website on IPFS. And that what that does is censorship resistant. So imagine having a censorship resistant website that can't be taken down. I think that point is often wow. missed and very important. Very cool. Now, because you did that, and we're going to do this as a separate clip, <laughs> I have to do that little bit of getting into this again. So my live audience, please pardon me. But here we go. JJ Sowers, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme? And part two of that, because it is different, is it a pyramid scheme? Why or why not? So I would say it's definitely not a Ponzi or pyramid scheme. And I'm absolutely a little surprised that people still ask this question because I've always said, especially recently, I mean, you know, what they should be asking is how big is the opportunity relative to the downside of not holding Bitcoin? And exactly. you know, when people say, and when people say Ponzi scheme, I think they might mean pyramid scheme, but I'm not 100% sure. So when I've done, you know, not just recently, but all through this time, I'll just keep looking up on Google, has the definition changed of a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme? So I thought a pyramid scheme was like a new investment or system that paid the profits from previous people in or previous investors. And there was like little or no value created or maintained. And I've looked up on Google several times. Well, what's a Ponzi scheme? And you know, it says something like a form of fraud, which the belief in the success of an enterprise that may or may not exist, basically takes payments with a promise of quick returns to the first investors and it pays them back, but people have to keep investing in order for them to pay back the original investors. And I think like a lot of the Ponzi scheme organizers will they'll promise like ridiculous high returns and say, oh, there's no risk. And I've heard stories about like with the Madoff thing, people's statements was always around the same return. I mean, the probability of that's basically impossible. So then I say, okay, so let's think about this. Why are people thinking that Bitcoin could be, you know, a pyramid scheme or a Ponzi scheme, whatever they call it? Well, it's possible they don't understand it, or maybe am I not understanding the question or the definition of a pyramid scheme or a Ponzi scheme? So that's why I go back to Google and just make sure, you know, the definition hasn't changed in the last few months or the last few years. But basically Bitcoin, you know, it has value. It's a store of value and many people compare it to gold. And I guess that's because people call Bitcoin digital gold. I've actually ran around saying it's millennials gold because the millennials see Bitcoin as gold because they're not into physical gold the way some of the older people do. And I guess with gold, you know, you say the price has, it has some use. People can make jewelry out of it. There's different demands for it. There's so much scarcity of gold as a commodity. And some of that's debated how much gold there really is. And if you look it up on the internet, there's different numbers for the market cap. I believe it's around 10 to 12 trillion, but I've even seen as low as 8 trillion. And I really had a hard time even comparing to silver, finding that the market cap of silver, which I think is around 1.2 to 1.4 trillion. So Bitcoin's getting pretty close. So the question to me is, okay, so what makes an, any item, art, Bitcoin, stocks, valuable at all? And, you know, do these things have resources behind them? So to me, I say that the computing power of Bitcoin is very valuable because like AWS with Amazon, what's so valuable? The computing power. And the, and the most valuable resource today going forward with Web3 and the Internet of Value is the computing power in the blockchain and things like Bitcoin. And you know, people always say, another thing people throw out, what's the biggest risk to Bitcoin? And no one ever addresses this. I would say if someone turned off all the computers in the world, the power grid went down. Now, obviously, common sense is if that were to happen, I think we got a lot more to worry about than Bitcoin. But that, to me, would be one of the biggest risks. 
And another thing too, a lot of people start saying, well, there's no interest, intrinsic value in Bitcoin and things of that nature. And some people make the same argument. Like, oh, and I always say that's a bullshit argument. I don't get into that argument because you could say that about anything. You could say that about art. You could say that about this water jug. I mean, if we're in the desert, this water jug is really, really valuable, oh. you know, if you need it. So, I mean, and then I know Mark Cuban has um, used the example of certain fruits or something like that. But what if I don't like that particular fruit or I'm allergic to that? I'm allergic to so, it, yeah. So, so, <laughs> so it it, it's, it's very, very personal. So I, I really don't get to that because beauty is in the eye of the beholder, as with any NFT, any art, any stock, any financial instrument. But another thing I always say too is um, I, Get that they might be skeptical of Bitcoin, but the CME has issued a futures contract, and now they're even yep. issuing a micro futures contract. Many well-known institutions are trying to get an ETF. And in the case of Madoff, yes, many very sophisticated, rich, wealthy people that should have known better did invest in this or possibly fall for him. But I mean, it wasn't exchanges like the CME. And also now we have companies like Microsoft that are launching decentralized infrastructure that's an application to be built directly on the Bitcoin blockchain. I believe they're coming to iron, and I think it deals with the underlying mechanics of how networks talk to each other. Now, I'm not real familiar how that's going to work, and it hasn't really been launched yet. But would a company like Microsoft build on top of a computer network that they believe was some kind of scam or pyramid or Ponzi scheme? I mean, I think those guys probably did a hell of a lot of research through the tech to make sure it was okay. Yeah, I mean, there's other things. Those are great ones. The one you just brought up about Microsoft I was going to bring up, uh, the government and how they're taxing it, how they're monitoring and regulating it, how states are approving crypto banks. We mentioned Wyoming and other states. The CME was a great one. Mass Mutual and other insurers that you and I know that are beginning to put it on their, you know, buying it as an investment, just it hasn't gone public yet. And eventually, when more institutional investors get involved, inevitably, sovereigns and governments are going to follow. Look at all the iconic investors, Druckenmiller, uh, Tudor Jones, Kathy Wood, and so many others that are being involved. And you didn't even get into, there are some ETFs in other parts of the world other than the US. And it seems inevitable, maybe I'm wrong, I think this year, that some well-known brands that we all know here in the US are going to launch ETFs. Then you have companies like Goldman and JP Morgan that I believe have over 100 people in their digital assets division. Admittingly, doesn't always mean it's specific to Bitcoin or crypto. They'll probably be active in the custodial aspect of the keys with that. There's just as more and more evidence that, again, the Ponzi scheme one is stupid, the pyramid scheme Again, I think that gets knocked back. Now, could you argue, could you argue there are some people that are in it to pump and dump and that it could be part of greater fool's theory, which is kind of a rational exuberance? Of course, but th that kind of applies to anything, like you said, to art or to the perception of what the value is of something, to not be involved. because, And then for that purpose, I think is foolish. I mean, I used to always say, okay, even if you may feel a little bit that way, but you're become self-educated, be a critical thinker, make your own decision, limit your exposure maybe to one or 3%. Uh, I've upped that from my perspective, that's just me, but everyone needs to do their own diligence and make their own decision. Right, there's a couple other things I want to add too, is Bitcoin to me is like the internet bank, a trillion dollar dominant digital network. And people, a lot of people don't know, you can send encrypted messages on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's a technological thing that serves value. And also people like PayPal and Square, they're getting their Bitcoin. But now on PayPal, 26 million merchants supposedly have accepted to be able to do Bitcoin payments. Yeah, those are, I mean, we could keep on going on and on. That doesn't mean that, again, it may not be incredibly volatile. And like I said, greater fool's theory, pump and dump. Those are all things that could happen to many stocks are, and other things that we're all familiar with. I will note again to everyone that everyone's situation is different. You need to do your own diligence. Everyone has their own time horizons, their own risk tolerance. There's a variety of factors. So as you're looking to invest in really anything, but including something that could be, although possibly for asymmetrical returns, that could be more risky, you need to be careful, do your own diligence. And again, one thing that some people do is to very much limit their exposure. Now, what Michael Saylor would say is you're then limiting 
tremendous upside that you're not getting involved in. So you need to, again, do your own diligence and make your own decision with your time horizons and your risk tolerance that's going to be applicable to you. But I'm glad that we had a chance to cover that very, very important question. Uh, there was a live audience comment that came in, and then I'll get a little bit to the close. I'm going to read it. One can assume that the government will not want Bitcoin to replace the dollar uh, or a Fed created digital currency for obvious reasons. Part two of that, or that was the comment. Now the question, could the government essentially ban Bitcoin by prohibiting the conversion to and from dollars to and from quote unquote Bitcoin accounts? So I would say that they could pass a law that definitely would say it was illegal to transact in Bitcoin or to pass it from one account to another. I think that's kind of far-fetched now that the CME has futures. But that being said, also, they, they may tax it or do something like that. But I, I just don't see it actually as competing with the dollar because Bitcoin is internet money. And once they come in, you, know, you could argue, well, when they come out with central bank digital currency, that's their version of internet money. But Bitcoin is digital gold or store of value. So it's not really competing in the same way. And if they were to ban it in the U.S., other countries would use it and it would be used kind of like a black market thing. And the value could actually go through the roof. I mean, absolutely. I've said that. Not only would it be a political football here in the U.S. to do that, since we now have state senators that are big believers in Bitcoin and own it. That's another factor relative to Bitcoin. It employs tens of thousands of people. Uh, generally people that are fluid in technology that are starting to do well financially, that pay taxes and spend. And do you want them just to get up and move to Canada or Mexico? Uh, I mean, that probably is what would happen to the industry. They won't just go away, they'll adapt. Trust me, they will. These are smart people that are really, a lot of them, big, big believers. Like uh, It's like a maximalist perspective. They would rather I'm not saying I would do this, give up their citizenship and just go on to a different country, take their intelligence, their money, their capital. So I don't see that happening, but theoretically, I mean, is it possible in the variations that JJ said, sure, you know, be familiar with, you know, uh, the Chinese miners with hash power. There are some concerns, it's not perfect, but again, you need to do your own diligence. So I do wanna end a little differently. Uh, I know we threw a lot of people, especially those, which is 99.9% .9 that are not very fluid in this, but hopefully it's exciting to many of you, at least to want to learn more and be a critical thinker and make your own decision. It's hard to do that in what a one hour podcast or video or even really two hours. What I will be doing is I will be creating a masterclass series with JJ, perhaps others to be involved as well, where we really break this down and do very, very deep dives, be much more interactive with the audience to answer all their questions and really put them in a position to be far more educated, especially on my side with the ultra, ultra high net worth and the family office community. My members of my organization will get a special pricing, but we are gonna to have to charge. It's only fair to people like JJ and others in terms of their time. So yes, it's not gonna be free, but it's gonna be something I believe that could be incredibly valuable to many of you. And again, stay tuned in the next 60 days, uh, especially for my family office association and my relationships in that community, but more broadly with others, we'll have an announcement on that. Before I do really a final, final close, JJ, if you want to give a little bit of a one or two or three minute or 10 second summary in terms of what we discussed today and potentially getting people excited about getting educated, making their own decisions and opportunities moving forward. I was going to say too, on the Bitcoin, keep in mind too that Bitcoin's decentralized. So it'd be very hard to shut it down. They'd literally have to shut out all the computers. So yeah, if all the computers were shut down, you could shut down Bitcoin. But Bitcoin's decentralized, so it's going to be very hard to just shut that down. Like we said, they can pass laws, but it'd be very hard to shut that down. And I really think they were really entering the opportunity of our lifetimes with not just Bitcoin, but with digital assets and blockchain. And people should definitely learn about these things. And especially if they have kids, really get into the things with the metaverse and the social tokens with their kids, because this is where value is accruing. It's all going now with people having their own brands and being decentralized 
and blockchain type things. And it's moving into real world applications as now people have woken up with NFTs and saying, wow, this is moving into real world applications. It's going to move into things like when you go to buy a ticket for a, a baseball or a football game, that's going to be an NFT so they know it's authentic. And there's probably many, many uses I've never even thought of. And as more people build on top of these things, there's going to be more and more real world uses and something that might be really personal to you or affects your business. So just like Mark Zuckerberg was saying, you know, you got to think ahead so you don't get disrupted. Keep up with those type of things. Yeah, I mean, I would say we spoke about some of the things today and gave it just a very brief overview. Didn't even really get into much on blockchain or DeFi and DeFi because it's a game changing, certainly potentially, and didn't really get too much into programmable money. And even if you're not a big believer in some of this, to think that we're not going to have central bank digital currencies, a variety of other cryptocurrencies, and understanding how to how to live and thrive in what could be a very different world moving forward sooner rather than later. If nothing else, it's self-preservation that you should become educated and more knowledgeable about the things that we're talking about. But enough about that. More to cover. I have one last thing to say about yes. the young kids too. So I was saying influencers are eating the world. So basically, so social tokens are giving back people like future of digital ownership rights and their own self-sovereignty for creators and people to monetize and take control of their most important asset, their brands. So, you know, young kids should invest in themselves and learn about this stuff, because if they don't, they're going to fall behind. And the people who are already in legacy businesses got to realize that influencers are moving into your type of business. I mean, people that are big time YouTube influencers are now starting venture funds and things of that nature and competing with, you know, old school world things. Absolutely. That's a great subject that we're going to cover upcoming in the future as well. Everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of the Angelo Robles podcast on YouTube and also a traditional podcast on Apple and Spotify. I'm the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. Learn more about us at, very simply, familyofficeassociation.com. Uh, you can learn more about membership or reach out to me from there. We're very active on social media, Family Office Association on Instagram, both my name and company name on LinkedIn, active on Twitter as Family Office, and most active lately on YouTube, where simply we're Family Office as well. Look it up. You'll find it. Uh, everyone, it's been great. Thank you to our live audience. JJ Sowers, you're incredible as always. And everyone, stay tuned. Much more on these topics to cover in the very near future. It's a very exciting time. Thank you and have a great Thank day. You.